Hello, welcome to episode 14 of uh, Jaga Vision. Uh, really happy to have you back every week. This is, I can't believe we're already at episode 14, kind of intense. We're gonna be, ooh, wow, my indestructible scale. Um, we'll be drinking some matcha yabukita today. Uh, we'll be joined by the, the ever so awesome uh, tea mistress uh, with uh, uh, her name is Jennifer, um, and uh, and we're also going to be joined by uh, Sherry Ann with, with, with Sister Speak. She's actually going to be outside of Jaga Silk. Uh, she's uh, done her show uh, on our uh, internet connection, and she's just been outside uh, doing that from 12 o'clock, doing a really lovely performance. Um, I'm also going to start out, as usual, by drinking a tea that I've never had before. So um, today I'm going to be drinking a black snail from the Keeman region in China. My farmer that we've actually worked with in the past. It's quite an expensive tea. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that we can bring in or not. We'll see. If I do, it might be more for for um, our private reserve or our reserve teas on our website. If you go to jagasilk.com, there's actually a, uh, if you go into the loose teas, you'll note that we have a number of selections in our reserve teas. I'm going to try out this teapot that we brought in. It's kind of cool. Let's see if it works out okay kind of interesting because it's made out of pure glass has an interesting filter that's also made out of glass on the inside kind of uh, on the smaller side which I prefer and lets us really load up with um, 240 grams uh, right to the top so if you're hoping to get a little bit more liquid in there you're kind of SOL so again, leaves looking pretty nice. I don't know if you can see that okay through the glass. But yeah, there's a good one. So black snail. Aromatic of cane sugar and rose. I'm really digging this terroir of the Keeman region. It seems to be consistent. water volume. I don't have enough in the kettle right now. I'm finding that it often has aromatics of rose. So I'm into that. Um, otherwise, just analyzing the leaf here. Yeah, really nice and vibrant looking. Uh, looks like full bud sets. Preheated the teapot. That's what you want to be doing here. I find that um, when I have uh, a leaf that's been withered this far, when I have a crimson tea or what we call black tea in North America that's been withered to the point where um, we see uh, these really dark leaves, um, I find that, that uh, an extraction that is a little bit uh, hotter, like using boiling water, the hottest temperature you can get in your, in your space, and then doing, I generally start out with three and a half minutes. Sometimes if I'm working with lower water temperatures, like if I'm in a cafe and I just can't get boiling water, um, then I'll, I'll bring it to four minutes if I'm using 90 degrees centigrade. Most hot water towers are 90 degrees centigrade. If you're in a high elevation, your water temperatures are gonna be a little bit lower, so you're gonna wanna work with longer extraction times. You're not gonna get the same cup of tea. Um, you'll definitely have a, a difference in flavor. Maybe you'll unlock uh, different compounds that I won't unlock using the system that I'm using. But I've found through trial and error that generally speaking, when they're withered this deep, this is the way to go. So, yeah. So water is at temp, three and a half minutes. I'm gonna fill to 240 grams. Looking very nice. Whenever you're choosing your teapot, Glass, ceramic are generally the way to go. Not a big fan of metal or plastic. Um, find metal 
seems to introduce a certain level of acidity that I'm less uh, excited about, and I find that um, plastic is just kind of creepy. Uh, don't like petroleum so much whenever we can get away with not working with it. In terms of flavor though, um, I have found that if you're using the same plastic device for the same tea over and over again, you're going to be in a pretty good place. Just going to rinse that out. I don't really find any need to preheat my decanter. Um, maybe if I was working with what, uh, 70 degrees centigrade water, then when I pour the finished extracted liquid, it's going to get pretty lukewarm and perhaps a little bit unsatisfying. If that's the case, then yeah, preheat your decanter. But when you're working with uh, liquid temperatures that are 80, 90, 100 degrees C, um, I think that you can generally, um, you'll generally find that you'll be in a good place if you don't preheat your decanter. It, it's going to cool the extraction to a, a, a lower, more drinkable temperature. You're going to find flavors are a lot more sophisticated the closer they get to room temperature. So really nice extraction happening in the, in the cup, in the teapot. Yeah. Wet fragrance again. Picking up that that cooked cane sugar note. Kind of a little bit of egg in there. Um, reminds me a little bit of a creme caramel. That kind of burnt sugar and milk and cream. Yeah, that's that's exciting. So, um, black snail um, sounds unappetizing in English, but the name in Chinese. Uh, is beautiful um, to the ears, so I can't pronounce it, nor do I remember the um, the Chinese for it. I wish that I did. Whenever we release these particular selections, we like to look up the Chinese and, and, and use that. Um, I love to use original language descriptions for teas rather than using the English translation. For example, when we have uh, Long Jing, I don't normally call it Dragon Well, although it's very well known in uh, North America as Dragon Well, that particular famous Chinese green, I'm uh, more apt to to uh, call it Long Jing when we release it. And I love to talk about cultivars too. I'd be very interested. We've bought from this farmer in the past. He had a Chun Tizong, um, a small leaf cultivar, kind of like an heirloom cultivar, that was uh, that was really lovely. Was it medium leaf? I'm betraying my ignorance here. This is what happens when I drink a tea for the first time. Huh, well, actually, that's all lies. I'm sure I remain. There's a lot I still don't know about the teas I've been drinking for years. Every harvest, every year is an exciting new adventure. Very nice liquid color. I think that was the right call for the extraction, just from the flavor, aromatics, sorry, the, yeah, just the, the smells I'm getting off of the dry and wet leaf. Hmm, I don't know if you can see that liquid color okay, but nice amber, red. Yeah, no, that's a uh, fairly rich extraction. I think that it requires a little bit more leaf. I'm noticing this as a sort of um, something that's turned into a little bit of a pattern with the 2020 leaves. Is I'm I'm finding that the extractions are fairly lightweight. for a number of different samples that I've brought in. That smelled amazing, looked amazing. The taste is somewhat lackluster. I think these are still amazing leaves. I just think I need to do something different. Perhaps I did need to go for the, the full four minutes, or maybe I need to dose a little bit higher. Maybe my scale was off a little bit and I was dosing less than I thought I was. 
there's a lot of reasons why this might be tasting less dynamic than I was hoping for. Also, as it cools, of course, there's going to be a little bit more interesting um, flavor dynamics that unlock. But uh, yeah, for the time being, that's where we're at. I think that if I was going to make this again, I'd try four minutes. Um, I'd also try just a, a higher dose for a shorter time frame and, and, and see what uh, see what that does. Yeah, Keeman Black Snail. I'm actually going to be bringing out a, a, a Maofeng, a premium leaf, uh, probably again a Chuntazong cultivar uh, from a different farm, uh, one that we brought out in 2019. So n uh, we've worked with this farmer in the past, but it was um, it was definitely uh, it was two years ago that we worked with this particular farm. So yeah, I'm gonna try out some. D See, this is the issue though with with uh, homogenized um, flavor sort of uh, extraction settings. You know, I, I'm a big believer in in having a good recipe to be able to recreate the tea um, consistently. But when we're drinking teas for the first time, um, I often do experiments like I'll take a sip and I'll throw the liquid back into the, the extra in onto the leaves and, and let it, you know, it's cheating, but I'll let it extract a little bit more if I feel that it's not an ideal place. Um, I will, um, allow that to sort of encourage a particular length of time when I, uh, especially when I don't understand a tea or I'm drinking a new genre for the first time. What's disappointing somewhat is when I have a tea that I've had before and the settings are noticeably different um, than the way that I was making it before. I find that it's not that that's upsetting in any way. It's just that it's just that, for example, if I have to use more leaves, then maybe it's not going to be the best, um, yeah, it's not going to be the best tea for uh, for our cafe customers or even our uh, even our our wholesale customers. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But uh, high hopes that uh, that just a longer extraction time will make things work. So we'll be joined by Tea Mistress um, in uh, a little bit. Um, and hopefully that will um, uh, that will be an interesting show today. We'll also be joined by um, what's their name? Uh, by yeah, by Sister Speak. So I'm just double checking my settings here. Apparently there's a little bit more noise than there normally is. Um, so you guys can hear my mic. It's okay. Desktop audio. So let's just double check that uh, my settings are in a good place yeah okay yeah everything's set up properly hmm I wonder why there's noise oh well hmm okay so um but uh, this uh you also notice in the description today that uh, when I logged in it was um it was boss shown by accident from last episode. I did change it well after I went live. So when you clicked on it, it would say episode 14. But as you're watching, the description says episode 13, or it might still. By the time this episode archives, it will fix itself to be episode 14. Macha yabu kita by Fujioka. So should be all good. If you're confused, just letting you know. And it is tasting a little bit better as it cools. I'm What it's lacking is the sort of sugary thickness that I've um, come to crave uh, uh, from this region. It's uh, somewhat watery. Oh, we have. Oh, hello, Jen. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, um, for some reason, there's an echo. I think it's gone now. I had you. I was watching your show. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. <laughs> awesome. All right, and now you're on. Lovely. Now okay. I'm so I'm going to bring you on to the show. Hello, uh, Jen. Welcome to Jaga Vision. <laughs> I'm, really, Thank you. I'm really glad you could make the time to come on and, and, and make this this uh, make this make possible. Um, well, and uh, lovely setup you have there. That's the, well, the, the tea room that you have on. So uh, to our audience, Jen owns uh, the tea mistress. Um, 
You also uh, worked with a tea company in the United Kingdom. Uh, are you? S you're still involved with uh, what is the, their Jade? Jade Spring Teas. Jade it's spring with tea. the General Trade of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, right now we're just closing up because it was really hard to get tea out of China this year. Fair and yeah. well, as you know, um, selling specialty teas can be quite challenging at times yeah. to make your margins work. So. Yeah. No, yeah. yes, it and, a bit and shipping out of China. That's really too bad. Uh, this year has been really hard for us too. Um, just trying to procure teas, not only from China, but from India as well. It's just been brutal. Um, shipping costs yeah. have gone up. The, the, the cost of, of, you know, everybody does business in USD and uh, just the way things are, are fluctuating with the currency exchange. It's, it's made a really big um, problem out of uh, just trying to make, uh, make a go of it. Hey. Oh, definitely. And what I what I found was a lot of our farmers, what we focused on were artisan, um, smaller than 10 acre farms, handmade. And in China, only a certain amount of farmers gets licenses for export. Yeah. So we need to have farmers that are willing to sort of go beyond the radar mm -hmm. and send you the teas. But now with um, the surveillance systems that are happening there. I had two farmers that said, Jen, we love you. We've been selling you tea for over 15 years now, but we're just feeling a bit uncomfortable. And I right. fully respect that. And I heard you talking about the Maofang. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years back, I was in Huangshan, Yellow Mountain. Okay. And there's a beautiful family there that are making Maofang that we were carrying. And I'd be happy to introduce you to try and have some samples she's got it that would be amazing yeah no i contacted a hong kong that she can send it to you that's but cool <laughs> yeah i'm actually worried about uh about, oh and sister speak has joined us <laughs> there you go Hello. jennifer uh this is uh sherry ann with sister speak um, Hi, sherry. um uh, sherry ann has actually uh been for many years based in in los angeles um, she's a career musician. She's also my sister, um, <laughs> and uh, her 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 music project, Sister Speak, is uh, is that's her that's her game. So it's been interesting for her too, with with COVID and dealing with uh, the lack of shows. And but um, but yeah, uh, Sherry Ann, this is Jen. Jen owns Tea Mistress. She's based in Salt okay. Spring. Um, we uh, we met her. How long has it been? Like three years, four years, or maybe yeah, longer. Well, we moved here, and um, it was actually our mutual friend from England that said, "Hey, you want to go have some delicious matcha?" Mm -hmm. And we had Japanese next door to you. Right. And yeah. That was when we first met, and I just was so amazed at the just the quality of your matcha, and Thank just you. Know, <laughs> with what precision and care you made it with, and mm -hmm. then. It was, um, yeah, whenever I talk about you and I, and I talk about Jaga Silk a lot, I often say how exciting it is to have such fresh matcha. Like, it's the freshest I've had outside of Kyoto, and it's nice. wonderful. Now with your new milling machine. <laughs> yeah, right there in the background. <laughs> I'm very, very proud of this thing, yes. No. <laughs> as, far, as far as I know, we're the only ones doing this on the tea bar level, um, milling our, our matcha fresh, so it's... Uh, oh. We, we did buy um, the owner of O5T, Pedro uh, Villalon. He uh, purchased a unit at the same time as us. So he is actually milling some Tencha in Vancouver as well, which is pretty exciting on the, on the same note. We do a lot of uh, information trading back and forth. And he's, he's actually released a collaborative um, where he's milling one of our Tencha uh, uh, from Fujioka in Vancouver. And then we're going to be milling one of his uh, uh, coming up in the summertime here. So. Yeah, pretty fun times, but yeah, it's it's good, and it, it means a lot. Those words from you, by the way, Jen. Um, you uh, being another tea enthusiast and operator, and uh, and knowing you know the, how how difficult it can be to not only access uh, fresh tea but to keep it fresh. Oh, totally. Right. And it's so nice to drink it seasonally, and I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. Mm -hmm. I find when people say, "Oh, Jen, what's your favorite tea?" And I'm like, well, we're just coming into summer, yeah. so I'm really liking my lighter roasted oolongs right now. Yeah. And and I just to to bring it back to the matcha, people often ask me, oh, you know, do you like matcha? And I remember, and now I love it thanks to you because I hadn't developed a palate for it. Right. 
because I was always drinking Chinese teas mostly. Right. And uh, and it reminded me is when I first drank matcha, I, I was like, oh, it's it's okay. Yeah. And, and it was the same as when people now say to me, oh, Jen, I don't like green tea. And I'm like, oh, wait. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, wait. There's, <laughs> there's a... Well, you know, I think it's because of... I think there's a lot of reasons why a person wouldn't enjoy a green tea or a matcha. I think that fresh product is probably the biggest one. But um, I think preparation is also plays a m massive role. You know, like I, I think that many people brew their green teas like they brew their uh, their crimson or their black teas, right? Like they're they are putting boiling water on it and that's just going to bring out so much astringency, so much tannin, so much. Um, and those flavor compounds are there. So from a Chinese medicine perspective, if you're making a decoction and you want to get everything medicinal out of the leaves that you possibly can, I understand that 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 extraction methodology. But from a flavor enthusiast perspective or from a even like yeah, and with matcha, you're consuming it. So I, I know that there's things that you get out of it with hotter temperatures that you don't get out of it with lower temperatures, but it's so nice to curate flavor in tea just in general, you know, and green teas, even out of China, um, you know, like some of your parched greens, 80 degrees centigrade makes such a big difference. If you start brewing with 100 degrees C, it's just the, the, the sandy texture that it produces on the tongue and that just horrid battery acid astringency is just very unlikable and i can see why people do very light extractions short you know and just smother it in honey as kind of a norm in north america mm. yeah when i was um in in the longjing region at the, at the lake there i was meeting some farmers she, and, she I and, and i was amazed that these are generational farmers that have been growing tea for i, I asked um to my friend i said you know how how many generations back have you been growing tea? He said, "Oh, Jen, forever. We our family's only ever done that." Right. And um, oh. very luckily, his farm is right in the actual national park. Right. Of, oh, very where, cool. Where the authentic tea comes from, sort of like the the terroir there. And when we were drinking tea together, the everyone in the family would just take a, a tumbler. Right. Like a glass tumbler, and throw a handful of leaves in, and pour water on top, and and then you would just. Drink it. And right. I found it really interesting for somebody who's just starting to drink tea because, um, if you put in, they would put boiling water, which was a little bit too hot. Uh huh. Is what I what I enjoy about that process is if you put in say around eighty then you can sort of see where your sweet spot is and you can learn the variances and the subtle nuances of the tea brewing. So as you take a sip at first, you're like, oh, it's really light. I'm maybe getting these notes from it. Right. And then as you drink down your tumbler, you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is when I'm drinking through a bamboo reed out of a fresh stream in the mountains. Wow. Yeah, this that's cool. This is the this is the flavor I'm looking for, mm. and oh, can I just show you guys something? Oh, oh wow, that's gorgeous. Where's you that? See, you see him eat the deer, eating the leaf, looking at you. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> He's Hello, like, deer. Oh, come on. That's so great. Wait, oh, I didn't see it. Oh, kind of. okay, okay, I'll go back. Sorry. Can you see him? Oh, there? there's the deer. Yeah, he's just like, what are you doing in there, Jen? He, <laughs> he, yeah. wants, he wants to join you for tea. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so beautiful. That's awesome. Huh. And then it kind of goes with the with the glass there. Then when you're drinking it, yeah. it, then you can see when it gets past the point of delicious. And then you can taste, like you were saying, that astringent, the bitter, the ugh, I don't like this. Yeah, you can, you can really experience that. That's, I mean, that's traditional, really, um, when you're cupping tea. I think that's uh, what you're tasting for is, is those moments. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, arguably you should be able to make any tea with really hot water and just, you know, that's going to just give you a better idea of, of say the flaws of the tea. Like when we're, when we're cupping tencha, we would always use boiling yeah. water, um, even though we know it's going to taste horrific pretty quick, but some, some of the really high end tencha doesn't get horrific. Um, and so it's interesting that it does accentuate quote unquote flaws in the, in the tea. Right. So, so 
but there's um I'm really a big believer in adjusting my brewing parameters to bring out the best that that tea has to offer. I think totally. that makes so much sense. And I think, yeah, doing this cupping methodology, the issue with, of course, uh, drinking it as it's steeping is uh, the top is going to have a very different flavor profile than the bottom and even like at that particular moment. So the decanting process of mixing all of the extraction together and then tasting it gives you a better sense of, of like a holistic sense of what that tea has to offer at that moment. But I love the cupping process for sort of the sneak preview that it gives you um, as you're as you're trying to dial in the, the settings for the tea, right? Yeah, and, and I guess that's what I meant by that was that it's I, I don't recommend brewing your tea that way. Mm -hmm. But if you like I'm recommending if you're if you're I just that. Yeah, for sure. green tea and you're like, I don't know how I like it, uh -huh. you know, and, and some people um, like it, I like my teas a little bit stronger. Some people like their teas a little bit weaker. So through that that experience, you can be like, oh, this is my honey spot. Yes, and I think yeah. it also um, it's nice to use a little bit more leaf. Um, people, I think, find there's there's a um, um, there's a um, I don't know how do I explain this. Um, there's a moment like a like a, where people will do cuppings where they're using too little like too little of a dose and um, e even though they're cupping and they're trying to get that sneak preview um i think that they've already ruined it from the beginning which is unfortunate for, for you know it's obviously different from tea to tea um but oh. i think it's great to to use kind of a method where you have five grams for um 150 mils like five ounces and then you just you know you start with that as sort of like your your flag post in the sand boiling water sure if it's going to be parched green, they'll probably want to bring it down to 80. And then it just lets you get a sense of, of what tastes good when, right? And yeah. But the reality is, depending on the oolong, sometimes it's way higher dose than that. Like in those little gaiwans that only hold like two to three ounces of liquid, you'll see people brewing um, six grams, right? And uh, that's like a double dose of what I just said. But uh, with crimson teas, you use so much less. So it's it's I think important to remember that um, yeah. for our viewers. I'm sure you're well aware of this, but oh, totally, yeah, no. But I think it's good that I think it's good for our viewers to to definitely hear that that nice approach that you've got because within what you're saying, you're exactly right in that you've got a more um, monitored flavor, and it, it's almost like a guaranteed result, which a lot of people want. Not not everybody wants to experiment and sort of. Uh, see how it goes, and I think maybe I'm. I guess I'm kind of a little bit more wayward like that because I was kind of taught on the road where I, when you said that sometimes you know people are putting six grams in a guy one. I remember my Taiwanese family; they would just jam the teapot full of uh, of different oolongs, but you know they would it, they would pour the water in right. Um, and usually just not a temperature kettle, but just sort of let it sit for a bit so it was off boil. Right. And just pour it right away. Just, you know, where when I'm sort of teaching people how to drink tea, I'll be like, this much tea for this much time at this temperature. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of neat. I find um, when you've been spending, like yourself, so much time with the tea, you can kind of hear the tea saying, that it's, oh, no. and I, I think that that's actually the best cups of tea I've ever had in my life have been from people who are meditatively involved in its, in its, in its extraction process. Um, and I find that, that, that when they're like really involved and they're, they're listening to it and they're, they're ready for it to be, um, um, like they're, they're, they're finishing the extraction at that moment of perfection. It just makes a huge difference for sure. Yeah, you know? Totally, so, I totally agree. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, I was actually just going to bring Sister Speak in on the conversation, but it looks like we lost her. Um, are you still there, Sister Speak? I saw her phone kind of like flip, yeah, draw. go sideways kind of thing. I think she might be uh, trying to trying to click back in. Well, when she comes back in, let's get her thoughts on, on I'm, I'm curious. She always, uh, she's not in the industry, of course. Um, she's uh, a musician and w what's always the nice perspective she brings to the show is just what is she doing as a non-industry person? How is she enjoying her teas and what is that process looking for her? So um, I'd love to bring her in on this when we, we do get there. 
when we do get her in. Um, but uh, I'll just, you know, she's actually just outside right now. Oh, okay. Let's, uh, hello, sister speak. She can't hear me. She's actually um, in Victoria right now, which is pretty awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so she's set up outside of, uh, of Jagasilk. That's nice to have your sister around. Yeah, no, it's, 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 been, uh, it's been good. Um, so um, where am I? I'm, uh, it looks like I'll just wait for her to come back on. I think she's just figuring out stuff with power supply and things like that. So yeah, my, my um, husband is also a musician, and he was a big coffee drinker. Oh, yeah? And he married me, and he was like, okay, babe, come on, let's, let's make some shifts over to the tea. Yeah. And what he uses in the studio is, you know those, um, the glass little, with a plunger on top, and you can put the, the, the strainer inside the uh, glass sort of decanter. Are you talking about a French press? No, okay. no. But is it you, similar to that? Like, is it a similar, like... In you don't press it down. They, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen one, honey. They've got the, it's like a little, so the top compartment. Yeah. So, okay, sorry, I'm not describing this well. So mm -hmm. the job to say is 500 mil. Uh -huh. And the top compartment, which has got a strainer, mm -hmm. which releases its strain when you push a little button, mm -hmm. holds like 250, 150 mil. And so you put your tea leaves in there, push it, water goes through in the strainer, got your cup. Right. And it's wonderfully simple for like a studio setup. Huh. Yeah, no, so, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm uh, just gonna, just give me two seconds. I wanna, sure. I wanna talk about this uh, French. <laughs> We're live and I'm leaving you for a moment. <laughs> Maybe you have a monologue for like two seconds oh, of the view. Okay. <laughs> Hold on one sec. I can monologue. So I, th I think for like people that are working and they want to drink tea and they like to have something nearby if you're working on your computer or you are in your studio or you're an artist and you've got it by your canvas or whatever your medium is, it's really nice to make it accessible for yourself so you can still have really nice tea but not have to keep um, a whole sort of tea setup there. And I'll post to Jared's link here afterwards um, uh, this certain press that I've talked about. You can easily find it and it's really accessible for just at your home or your studio and you just want to have good fresh tea and nicely brewed because a lot of friends are always like, oh Jen, I, I don't have all the equipment to make the tea. Mm -hmm. And so, and a big part of it is brewing and then making sure you drain all the water out because if there's any water left in your big teapot, yeah. then it, it over brews and it's all about the infusion. So with this handy little device, I said I would put a link to your website, Jared, on this on the side feed here after the show. Nice. Okay. If people wanted to find one, they can because it's perfect for studios or by your computer if you're working at home or... Are, are you talking about the, the the mason jar brewer? No, I know. I um, I'll send a photo. It's they they make them in China and Hong Kong, and they're quite common there. Okay. And I've seen them in um, hmm. uh, a couple shops in Chinatown in Vancouver have them. They probably would have some in Victoria too. And it's uh, and once I show you, you're gonna go, oh yeah, Jen, one of those. I'm just really lousy at explaining uh, what it. Like. Maybe it has a filter built into the lid. I I don't know. I'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hario <laughs> makes a really good version of that as well, then. Um, uh, and also, um, Kinto, two Japanese companies. Oh, um, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where and they they can be really beautiful. Like uh, I might even have one. I like to oh, test out equipment. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I hope it's what I'm thinking it is. Like this guy? Uh, no. No? Okay. So you can actually, but this is really easy because you can just put the T in and then it has a filter built in to... Uh, oh, okay, yeah. And then, it, then it, you put it in like that and then when you're brewing, it's really easy. There's no spillage. It's... It's quite nice. I've also, uh, you were watching the show, so you saw this. This is really simple too, just one piece. Um, oh, yeah. clean. oh, so then you're measuring your water before you put it in. That's right, yeah. yeah. Nice, that works great. Yeah, and then it's just, it's easy to work with and all that. Uh, 
CA woman one says hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I um, thank you for doing that monologue for me, by the way. We figured out no. what's up with Sister Speak. Um, uh, we are um, <laughs> somebody trying to, to come into this. <laughs> um, we are um, she basically lost power on her phone, so she's just trying to figure that out. She might actually just come in and join me. Oh, is she, is she back? Oh, there she is. Amazing. <laughs> Okay. And then if it dies again, then I'll, if I lose power again, I'll just come in right <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. That, that makes sense. Okay. It's awesome. pretty cozy out here though. I just put a, a winter jacket on, even though it's summer. <laughs> well, it's chilly out today. You know, June, Victoria, it's normally warmer than this. It's been pretty cold. Um, we were just talking about, uh, how Jen's husband brews tea and I would love to get your thoughts on how you brew tea just in general. Um, what is the process that you do when you're on the road? And then I'd love to get into making some matcha, if that's cool. And we can keep oh, talking perfect. while we're uh, while we're while we're making tea. Okay. Um. So I'm. Uh, I love. Okay. So with matcha, now I bring my bowl and my whisk. <laughs> you... Um. And I brew it often. Um. I brew it. Um. Sorry. Um. I brew it <laughs> with a like. If I do a boiling kettle, I do the transfer system you taught me. Oh, nice. And then, yeah, that's probably good yeah, to point out too. Yeah, you don't, you don't then, have to have a temperature um, variable kettle, right? Um, you can have a, uh, you can just use the vessel transfer system for sure. That works great. And then when I'm on the road, sometimes if I'm really tired and I'm driving, I don't like to drive tired ever. So I'll just sprinkle some, I'll get some water from the gas station, some hot water, and then I'll add a little cold water to it. And then I'll just sprinkle matcha in, in the, in the cup and just, that mix works. it hey, with, yeah, why not? with a wooden fork and <laughs> at least it's something because i it helps with like give me some like a little bit of extra nutrients and help me keep me awake i'm like you know when you're so i don't road. crash you know one of our um one of the pe the fellow who built this beautiful bar um jess williams with fusion design woodworks um he actually uh cooks uh <laughs> milk up on the stove and then puts he just powders matcha into the <laughs> the milk that he's cooking on the stove and then he whisks it and i was like oh man what are you doing and uh but i thought it was does it clump he's uh he uses a bamboo whisk in the milk which don't do it at home it's gonna ruin your whisk but you know to each their own right and um and he ends up making a drink that he really enjoys he made it for me it was actually pretty good it was just hilarious that he's whisking right in the pot on the stove but you know i think the, the point that we're trying to make here is you don't have to be like measuring your tea, measuring your water, controlling water temperature and extraction time every time you make tea. Um, even at origin, um, people are just putting leaves into water and letting it, letting it hang out in there all day and just drinking it as they go about their day. So it's not like there's like a rule that says tea must be made in a particular way. I think that what yeah. we're doing at the tea bar and what I assume, uh, Jen, you were likely doing in, in, in England is, is being careful that your, your cups of tea were consistent from cup to cup so that your customers have a, um, a, a flavor that they, they know that they can look forward to when they visit your establishment. Yeah, well, I didn't really have an establishment. We wholesale to businesses. So okay. I would go okay. in and uh, train the staff on how to make the tea. But for them, then you were you were sharing a particular preparation protocol. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense, right? Because I think in a cafe environment, we want to have that consistency and it just makes so much sense. So, yeah. It makes such a difference, as you said, when you make it, um, when you make it in its most efficient form, because there, you know, there's no need to reinvent the the um, the wheel with tea making, because it's been drunk for millennia. But it's it's like you said, there's a we, over time sort of refined because it's so subtle the nuances of the flavor. Yeah. So if you can find a way that they can come out and. And, and you can really taste them. Mm -hmm. Also for the people at the cafe, because mostly they're coffee drinkers, right? So their their palate's not necessarily as sensitive for the tea, so they really need to follow your directions. The baristas. Well, I think that's a good point. Is it not necessarily that the palate isn't developed, or it is or it isn't, but generally speaking, though, you might be talking about just experience, right? And I guess those two are interrelated for sure. And well, I guess I'm, not, I'm not saying that their palate's not developed, but yeah. their palates are developed for coffee. And when you drink a lot of coffee and then you drink tea, because coffee is such a strong flavor. Right. And don't get me wrong, I do love a good cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, me too. But it really, like before people come to my classes, like if I'm having a class 
during the day, I'll say, can you please not drink coffee in the morning today? Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because I really want, with especially with a lot of the lighter green teas and the lighter roasted teas, mm -hmm. the, the flavor is so subtle. Right. And I really want people to be able to learn to differentiate those really subtle flavors. That makes a lot of sense. You know, um, yeah. they talk about... Yeah. Uh, before going on the the, 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 the cupping table um, in India, for example, um, there's a great book by the feel, people at Camellia Sinensis in Montreal called Tea, History, Terroirs and Cultivars. And um, in it, there's a discussion about, uh, um, I believe that was the book that I was reading. It. Correct me if I'm wrong. And when it, viewers, if you read this book and it's not there, I'm sorry. But I believe this is where I got this information from is that at auction, they've been asked to not have really intensely flavored food before they cup um, because it's going to impact how they're tasting the teas as they go on the cupping table. And that uh, was actually a, a revolution um, because it just helped them to understand and taste so much more sophisticated flavors when they weren't interrupting um, flavor before they started. Right. So, so keeping the, the palate neutral so that you can, you can um, taste these more nuanced flavors makes a huge difference when you're on the cupping table for sure. Um, while we're talking, guys, uh, let's let's start making some some matcha. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so you're gonna want to um, preheat your bowl. Okay. And then, um, you know, I always to, for our viewers, um, you might be a little bit intimidated by the scale, but I've mentioned this in previous episodes. But the scale makes such a huge difference from uh, day to day. Moisture levels are gonna change you're gonna find that um, the same amount of visible volume of tea is actually gonna measure out different, uh, a different mass. Also, uh, although matcha is filtered um, after it's been milled um, to a particular um, size, doesn't mean that it's always going to be, um, it's not always gonna be uh, consistent. So even the, 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 the mill size is gonna change. Um, so it really makes a big difference to to weigh out your tea. If you just can't, a uh, leveled off teaspoon works. In tea ceremony, they use a chashaku, so one, uh, generally two scoops, one larger one and one smaller one if you're making usucha, which is what we're gonna be making today. So guys, we're gonna be making a, a style in tea ceremony called usucha. Okay. Um, normally you would use like 1.25 to 1.5 grams and you do 60 okay. grams of water, but today we're gonna do two grams of tea. Two grams, okay, okay Jared, I'm really just learning all about matcha from you. I definitely have made no claims to know anything about matcha. No, so. it's, it's all good. We're so, I'm still I'm still a learner myself. Um, but you want to put the, the the sieve onto the bowl. You're gonna tear the scale that the bowl okay. and the sieve are on top of, and then you're gonna weigh out 2.0 grams of matcha. The resolution of your scale is gonna play a role as well. If it's only a one gram resolution and not a 0.1 gram resolution you're going to be more accurate just using a measuring spoon. That being said, if it has 0.1 gram or better resolution for the scale, then you'll be able to um, you'll be able to use it and have a more accurate dose. I love how fresh this tea is. June 15th milk. <laughs> <That's Woo>! nice, eh? <laughs> yeah, and I love what about that aromatic, eh? Well, the color as well is just oh, neon, brilliant. I love it. Yabukita by the Fujioka family. Wow. So uh, let's confirm we're all making the same tea. Uh, Jen, I know you uh, have a number of selections, but we're on Yabukita by Fujioka. Check. Yes, yes check. Sir. Awesome. Okay, we're all on the same page. Excellent. Um, Just for our viewers so they can see a little Nice. Action. Yeah, and I can also show them the color. Look at that yeah. color, viewers. <laughs> yeah, the color is... That was the big thing, Jerry, when I first started drinking tea with you. Like, don't get me wrong. What about in Japan? Yeah. It's lovely matcha, like just jaw-droppingly beautiful. Right. Um, but, but in North America, I like to show people this. Look at the, the stuff here. This is oxidized matcha. That's what I was used to here. And then well, this is fresh matcha, right? And the difference in color is enormous. The flavor of old matcha, like when it's oxidized like that, tastes like old hay. It's ridiculously yeah. unpleasant. Lots of tannin, easy for it to turn the stomach. So if you're yeah. one of our viewers and you have some matcha in your cupboard and you're like, oh, I haven't drunk that matcha in three years. I think I'm going to go and, and make some after watching this show. I highly recommend you just use it in bath water or you put it in your compost. Um, 
when you ingest it, it's going to be a really unpleasant experience. Um, it's not going to hurt you like curdled milk or anything like that, but it definitely doesn't have the medicinal vibrancy and the flavor impact that it would have if it was fresh. And I think we could marinate some fish in it. Uh, in well, old matcha? It would just not be good to eat at all. I just, I find it enormously unpleasant. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd mix it with some Epsom salts um, and I'd put it in bath water. I think that would be a really good yes, way to Yes, I love doing that. Yeah. I've never tried that. I'm excited. Sorry, what were you saying, sister? <laughs> um, it's I, I do that a lot. I, I I started whisking. Is that okay? Oh, you're already ahead of the game. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is a hishaku. This oh, filled uh, eighty percent of the way is uh, sixty grams. So sixty grams over one point five is very similar to our ratio of ninety grams over two. So okay. your water temperature ideally is sixty degrees C. Um, oh, if great. you. If, okay. If you don't have a temperature variable kettle, that's four vessel transfers from boiling. Oh, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And then Sorry. a lot of matcha, uh, if you're from the south, can be made with 70 degrees centigrade water. But 60 degrees is really good for anything coming out of Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And okay. oh, 60, perfect, luckily enough here. Okay. So how much water am I putting in, honey? You're going to weigh out 90 grams. And then I gave a uh, uh, sister speak. You want to show the audience the kettle that I or the thermos that I gave you? Yeah, this is red. It has a temperature. It went down to like a little bit below, a little more closer to 60, but it's still pretty good, right? What are we at? It said 60. That's exactly what we want. We want 60. Yeah, seven, oh, amazing. Se 70 is for down south. Sister, can you hold that up again so I can see it? Oh, yes. Andy. Oh, that's beautiful. That's yeah. Cool. So it's a thermos? It's a thermos with a temperature dial on it. We're going to be bringing those out pretty soon. Oh, I need one. Yeah, it's nice because then you don't have to have electricity. It's good for when you're going, like, say, and making mountain matcha, etc. So when you're, when you're whisking, pour that 90 grams of water over top. You want to whisk for 15 seconds. Remember that ex uh, agitation is a form of extraction. And I like to, I like to whisk for... Um, basically, I do... Uh, I whisk slowly in the beginning with the pressure of brushing teeth, and then I whisk vigorously in the center for about five seconds, five Mississippis, if you're not looking at an analog clock or a clock of some kind. And then I do seven seconds of froth integration so that I can get a nice creamy texture. And when you... I, uh, I, I give Dad some of the matcha too. Oh, amazing. Okay, cool. In... So I put mine into I don't I normally try to do a transfer, but I transferred a little bit. In the, in the, no, that works. Yeah, my father is uh, in, in downtown right now, too. And... He's a lovely guy. I met him at the shop one day when you weren't there. He's super jolly. Yeah, he's, he's way too much fun. Way too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, there he is. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Saying hello. That's amazing. Hey. Hello, Toe. In my bubble. <laughs> in your bubble. Um, so uh, uh, hello to Toe. And while we're drinking this, guys, if you want to fill your mouth with... Um, one third of the liquid it gives you a really good sense of the texture of the tea so i don't know what you guys are picking um, up but i'm smelling some really nice notes of uh kind of fresh cut grass snap pea there's like a snap yeah snap pea for sure yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. jerry you used to do the you still obviously do the Eagle, Raven, and Owl. Does this fall under any of those categories? Yeah, so we used to have that system for differentiating um, so that we could um, kind of have like a, a threshold that the teas were in. But what we learned is that from year to year, they would change so enormously that we couldn't really define a genre as anything other than a particular price point. Um, mm. and there wasn't really a flavor profile that we were able to keep consistent, especially in that Raven genre. Um, there would be... You know, if you buy from Kyoto, you're paying for Kyoto. Like Kyoto um, selections from Fukuoka of a similar quality are always going to be cheaper. Um, it, it's just the nature of the game. So um, they're also going to be produced in a different way. So I decided, or we decided as a team, that we would get rid of that owl, raven, and eagle designation because it, it, it doesn't have you think about differences uh, in flavor so much. But this, long story um, short, this was a raven. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we no longer call it that. We call it a Yabukita by Fujioka, 
um, and it's part of our kind of competition grade uh, selection. That's interesting because Dad guessed that it's a raven. He would, yeah. <laughs> he's got a good palate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. <laughs> and he said that I actually made it okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. I don't use. I I I thought I'd I screwed it up. I thought I'd, mm -hmm. I thought I just whisked it way too long. <laughs> How long were you whisking for? Um, I guess maybe like 15 seconds. How long are you supposed to whisk for yeah, again? Yeah, 15 seconds. So 15 seconds oh, is the really? idea. Yeah. How's that tasting over in Salt Spring there, Jen? It's, you know, all of your teas, Jared, are really quite, it's, it, having fresh matcha is breathtaking. And this one mm -hmm. in particular, I'm really liking. I'm totally getting the snap peas, which is such a beautiful seasonal right on point because i just got some snap peas in my csa box yesterday nice nice i got some almost ready to harvest in my garden yeah yep. and uh i'm also i'm really getting like a nice earthy undertone it's more like unami flavor is that the right word yeah, for yeah, it yeah, yeah that kind of brothy soupy flavor brothy. in the background I'm not getting that sweet sometimes that i get with with the matches that i sample from you and this one is, is more, it's, it's very smooth, it's very rounded. I've got a really nice like mouth feel mm -hmm. under and around my tongue. Right. Yeah. Um, no, that's, and... I find that this one's very balanced. Um, one of the reasons why it used to be in that genre of Raven is just that really nice balance of bitter, sweet, and acid, right? Like you just get this, like you get a nice acidity, but you have the, the umami sort of like wave up uh, uh, after, right. like from the finish. Um, it ends up, starting out bitter but finishing sweet yeah. which is really fascinating to me that um that that would be the case you know um but super um in interesting too that it's a, a single cultivar um i think that that's that's really um unusual um i think we start to we started to talk a little bit more about cultivars um uh, now and we used to talk about them less in the past but definitely the norm in uh, in the tea industry in Japan is that the farmers will sell to a co-op, the co-op will sell to a tea company, the tea company will blend multiple estates selections together, give it a poetic name, and then they will um, they will release it. And so when we're buying tea in Japan, it's almost always like 99% of the time going to be a blend. Um, and although it will be single origin or single region, it won't be single estate um, and it won't be single cultivar. And I think it's so interesting to try single estate, single cultivar selections, especially when you have like with Fujioka, we have the Yabukita that you guys are drinking right now. He also has an Okumidori. Um, he has another Okumidori that we also, we have actually have two Okumidoris from him. One is from his Fukada lot and one is from his Okuda lot. And they're two different lots of the same cultivar and they're going to have different flavors entirely <laughs> just because of where they were growing um, in that micro region, which I find so interesting. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's very much like Kuwer in that sense, where um, before, um, now Kuwer, the, the raw, the maucha, is sent to the factories from all the different, if it may be their wild pig, maybe they're more cultivated, but they're all sent to these centralized factories to get processed and pressed. And yeah. so that reminds me of that process a lot. And um, so interesting to find them before they've gone to the center, hey? Like to be able to access Puar that's maybe pressed at the village level and not gone through the, thir the 13 main factories. And it just gives you a completely different nuanced experience with the same region, right? Um, but by being able to try a different recipe than perhaps is normal. Not always better, not always worse, you know, but definitely different than the norm. Like you said, I like the nuances of that there. I just, um, what my favorite tea shop in London is called Postcard Tea. Yeah, I love Postcard. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's uh, run by this wonderful man named Tim who is, he would just fall off his chair if I called him this, but I will. I, I do think he's a real, like he's he's worked on tea so long. He's, he's really on that sort of master category because he cares so deep. I, I should say, I haven't actually been to Postcard. I've just had their teas at Proof Rock. Uh, oh. 
in uh, in London. So it was made for me by a coffee shop, but it was fantastic, and I love the concept. And you've you've spoken wonderful things about proof uh, about uh, postcards. I just ordered a bunch of teas from him because I didn't order all the spring teas like I normally do for the tea company, in which I right. kids I'd be like swimming in samples right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any tea, and um, so I emailed Tim and I ordered. Um, these really beautiful Phoenix oolongs, which he gets from this exquisite farmer um, in the in the Fujian region, but farther on the eastern side, um, bordering on the Yunnan there. And it um, and I actually don't quote me on that. I'm trying. I'm just thinking. I think I might be incorrect there. Okay, no, but fair enough. The, I think it might. Anyways, it, they're, they're Phoenix oolongs from Phoenix Mountain, and I want to say they're in Yunnan, but I'm not. I can't remember if they're. Anyways. The basic point I'm trying to get to yeah. is that these teas are all picked from individual trees. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, last episode of Jaga Vision. We, um, we were uh, tasting a 144-year-old single tree pick, uh, Phoenix Mountain Oolong, um, from mm -hmm. um, that uh, Mr. Chen, a farmer I think I've shared selections with you uh, from in the past. Um, Where's Phoenix Mountain? I'm totally drawing a blank. What region is it in? I should know is this. It, yeah, I think it's in Yunnan. No, it's not in Yunnan. I actually know yeah. this. Fujian. Look at us, hey. We're uh, we're we're tea uh, tea company people. And actually, I'm like, oh gosh. Um, where well, is actually, I know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Fujian. Um, I uh, Fujian's popping into my head, and I know that's not true. So no, I know. I said Fujian first. I'm gonna just look it up quickly here. Okay. Cause... Feng Shuan, Tianzu Keng. Feng Shuan, China. That's Feng Shuan is Phoenix Mountain. See, on all my stuff, I've been putting Phoenix Mountain. I know it's it, like it shares a lot of preparation similarities to to Wu Yi. Um, you looking it up right now? Guang, yes. Is it Guangzhou? Yeah. I feel like uh, I feel embarrassed that I don't know this. I carry a lot of uh, Phoenix Mountain teas, and I'm just like, here's. Well, you know what? The reality is, um, that's that's. I tell people I've been doing this for 15 years and that's nothing. It's like a drop in the bucket for people that have well, been doing not. this for 40 years. They got it. They got it down, you know, <laughs> 10 years, 15 years. It's nothing. Uh, when you've been doing this for 30, 40 years, it's just, uh, Liaonong, Liaonong province. Phoenix mountain is one of Liaonong provinces four famous mountains. Awesome. Okay. Um, Liaonong, Liaonong. Can you spell it for yeah. us? Yes. Oh, can I spell it for you? Yes, I can. L I A O N I N G. L I A O N I N G. Yes. Leoning. Okay, I'm gonna just put that on the chat mm -hmm. for everybody. And. Um, awesome. Cool. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. Um, you know, Leoning. Um, because we always ever just talk about Phoenix Mountain, it's hilarious. But they they produce some amazing, amazing. It's right next to Fujian, basically. Mm -hmm. It's in between. Fujian, it's like east of here. Like that, and I'm embarrassed that I couldn't remember. Okay. It looks like a. It all looks like rainbow. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the phone isn't actually showing us, no, but it's, it's it's all good. You know, Fujian. Um, I was gonna say Fujian because Wuyi Mountain is in Fujian. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, Liaoning is right on the crest. There's like a, there's another province that shares the same mountain range and a lot of tea is grown on that particular mountain range. It's a, it's an excellent origin for, for, for your Chinese tea selection. I've never been there. Yeah. I've uh, never been we, to we, we, a few times, but never to Yanchang. We almost went, we were so close. Um, but it just didn't work out in the end. We were, uh, there was a visa issue where I was in Japan. And mm -hmm. um, Miu, my wife, she's Japanese, and she was going to be fine because um, the, the, um, they're just totally fine um, with the Japanese people going to, to China. But if you're Canadian um, at the time, this was before the whole like Huawei um, issue. Um, this was, um, but I couldn't go because uh, something had happened internally in Japan where short stay visa people couldn't go from Japan to China because they had a system crash. I don't know how real that was, but I remember oh. going to Tokyo. I'd already purchased tickets. It was on my itinerary. I was totally going to go, but they wouldn't let me. They said, if you go back to Canada first and then go to China, then we'll let you yeah. in. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so we had to cancel the trip. It really sucked. 
Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Harper made so many deals with China. We won't get into that on the show, but he made so many deals with China that because I have an English passport and a UK like a, a UK passport and a Canadian passport, and I when I got my first visa from Canada, they gave me a ten year visa for China, right. like that. Like just right back. So no, I'm going stamp. Yeah, they they and, told me that if you get, they said you should just get your ten year visa. It's really easy. And so and yeah. then in the UK, it was because I was leaving from there, mm -hmm. and the ten year visa had already expired. My mm -hmm. old Canadian one, and with the UK one, it took days. I had to go back and forth, and I could only get. I think it was two months or something really short like that. So it was interesting to see like, where you're coming from and how easy it is to get there. Yeah, but, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of. It's interesting with with the pandemic and how it's affected travel and how, mm -hmm. like, you know, I've always wanted to go to China, go to uh, India. We we regularly go to Japan. Um, part of it is, you know, Mew's family's there. The other part is that's how we started this business. Five years, we were only doing matcha. We weren't doing the loose teas. Um, speaking of actually samples, this is, uh, I wonder if I have them here. Yeah, hold on one sec. Well, hopefully everything um, makes a joyful shift. To yeah. Healing and nourishing. This is my, my, my bag of, of like. Oh, you tease. <laughs> those are all 2020 samples. Um, there's them. another one upstairs. There's just hundreds and hundreds of little 20 gram bags from different farmers in uh, mostly China, India, and Japan. Wow. But, but it's. Are they farmers? Sample? Sorry? Go ahead. Oh, Jen. Your question. Oh. <laughs> I was just wondering how you uh, how do you sample them all? That must be a lot of tea drinking. <laughs> it is a lot of tea drinking, and uh, normally what we do is we have a group session, which are going to restart tomorrow. And it's actually an interesting segue that uh, those watching right now, there'll be a random um, tea cupping that happens on Fridays whenever we can with the team. Um, so I'll have the Jaga Silk team. There's four of us that will be just um, that will be cupping teas live. And uh, we'll probably line up a whole bunch of teas and we'll just be tasting them. We'll be very careful to not uh, spread any viral infections by, um, by having our own cups and being very careful with, with distancing, etc. Um, and it's something that we put on pause for a number of months. Um, and to not even be able to cup with everybody has actually proven to be really difficult because we get hundreds and hundreds of tea samples. And if mm. we're not going through them, then we're not going. Now, the ones that are left over in the end, we often will just mix into one big bag of tea th and we'll make a kombucha out of it that we call Spectrum. <laughs> so, <Ooh. laughs> so if you see if you see Spectrum kombucha, it's us going through our uh, our our samples or our smaller selections that weren't okay. anything that we could. We could yeah, yeah. So, anyway, it's uh, what I, the reason I brought this up is is it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting to see how the tea industry develops um, with this sort of limitation on travel. I know that with many farmers in China, um, even if they have the best intent, they'll sometimes sell you a different tea than what you cupped. And it's so much easier um, to just, you know, if I, I've always desired to get to the point where I could be in China, have them open a bag of tea for me, drink it, and then just buy that badge, you know, um, that, I've, that I've cupped right there. Um, so that I know that I'm getting exactly the batch that I cupped. And yeah. that's definitely a desire that I have. And that was actually something that was brought up to me by a fellow from Wu Yi Mountain. He said, in Wu Yi, some of the farmers will actually, that's something that they do is they'll have you try their better tea and then they'll, they'll sell you. If you don't have the trust relationship built, then they'll, they'll, they'll give you, uh, they'll do bait and switch, right? Where you're given a completely different tea than what you, uh, so that's like, it's just going to China, and I was pretty, you know, really blessed to be able to go over the last 20 years and, um, you know, meet all these different farmers. And I've, I've gotten, I'm so happy to share my contacts. It's like one of those things where I'm just like, some tea people are like, kind of hoard their contacts, right. but I'm just like, if I scared, if you can bring in the tea and I can drink it, then I'm so happy. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. No, that's really sweet, Jen. Yeah, we yeah. really believe in transparency as well. It's an interesting, you know. I think um, it's an interesting 
kind of conundrum, not conundrum, but it's a challenge for sure. Like how open should you be? How close should be you be? You know, like I'd like to believe that any farmer I work with would be really careful to not necessarily, um, uh, what, like, uh, go and, and, and sell to somebody who's in the exact same region as me. That would be my hope. But I also, I feel that that should develop through um, uh, a relationship of trust and understanding, right? Rather than rather than signing contracts and things like that. And, and, and I love to be able to showcase to my customers, like this is where it's from. I think through more transparency, you build trust in, in throughout the entire system. So to be able to say, this is the farmer who grew it. This is when they grew it. This is when they harvested it. This is the cultivars that they use. This is the soil structure, etc. You know, like it, it, it does, I think, do a lot for 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 um, for the industry. Right. So that's, that's really awesome that you are also really open with your. With yeah, your my, my teacher in Wuishan, Li, mm -hmm. she's also my Gong Fu teacher. So she teaches me how to pour Gong Fu ceremony. Oh, nice. OK. Um, and I've been working with her for about 10 years now and she's really helped me refine the 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 pouring process and so um that's something that i teach here at the tea school mm. um but one thing that's really beautiful about getting the teas from her is she has her in wuishan there's the park yeah and then you've got the the mother bushes right when and when you go there, these it's in this beautiful natural park, and you get to the mother bushes, and they, they don't really look like much, and they're just up on this little ledge, and people are praying and pouring tea, and um, it's it's a big deal to go and visit these these tea bushes, and they don't harvest them anymore. They stopped harvesting them probably I'd say eight to ten years ago, and it's interesting. Tim from Postcard Tea, yeah. he gets his dahang pao because it's he gets it from the man who used to harvest the, the original bushes for the oh, government. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. He's the, that's the master he gets his tea from. Hmm. And, and, and then they call it, as I'm sure you know this, but I'm sort of telling it for our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there's different, it's like a lineage from the mother bushes. So they'll take a cutting from the mother bush. And then this part is planted in the national park. And then those are cut, 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 back, 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 back. And then and out. The you go, um, the, it's sort of, I get, they say that there's the less potency. And they, they, they talk about years old, right? Like how old are the, the cuttings that you're working with? Uh, you know, and, and really they need to be 300 years or more is what they say, you know, but or, and also degrees from the mother. Right. Yeah. Like how so many, how, how many degrees from the mother are they? And, um, these, these bushes, her family farm was originally in the park, mm -hmm. but then they made it into a park. Right. So that they got pushed out, but they still have bushes that they can access there. And then they also have wild bushes in behind right. and they pick it all by hand and, a wonderful thing is when you, if and when you work with her, try her teas, if you can't be there for the harvest, mm -hmm. which I have been before, which was wonderful, but if you say can't be there, she sends you pictures. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. A whole process and her family's so lovely. She's got three brothers and it's like a that's family. That's very sweet. No, um, and, uh, Fujioka, the fellow that we're working, um, that we're drinking his tea. So this is, um, he's actually a seventh generation farmer. Cool. And, and I remember when we first started working with him, um, we were uh, we were like, OK, it was actually an introduction through uh, one of my university professors. And we try a lot of samples, but she just gave me some tea. It was just you know, everybody gives us you know, people give you tea. But I remember mm -hmm. drinking his tea and going like, wow, this is amazing. And then uh, reaching out to him and saying, hey, you know, we're in Canada. We'd really like to bring in your tea. And he's like, sorry, I don't do wholesale. And we're like, oh, really? Like not even a little bit. And he's like, yeah, sorry. And, uh, and we're like, really? OK, can we? maybe can we visit you and have a discussion about it? Like not necessarily about having wholesale, but can we just visit you and drink your tea? And he's like, sure. Yeah, come on over. And so we made a trip over there. And then when we were there in person, we asked him again and he's like, yeah, sorry, no. And we're like, okay. And, and then we, then we went back again the next year and he's like, well, I've been thinking about it. And if you just let me know in advance of the harvest, I could put aside a little bit for you guys and not sell it to the, uh, the co-op. Cause he only sells in supermarkets. Um, like he keeps a little bit for himself to sell direct. And then yeah. he, uh, but he didn't have a, he didn't know how to use uh, uh, internet. 
Um, oh, you guys aren't going to be able to see me anymore, by the way. The, the, the camera is shut down that you guys have been, but we're still, I can see you. So just don't think oh. that, 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 it, that it's quickly. Okay. Oh, there we are. Okay. So the stream has reconnected. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So sister speak, you're there. Hello, sister speak. Did we lose sister speak too? Okay. Hello. Oh, there she is. Okay, awesome. Um, so, um, Sister Speak, so you were hearing a little bit about this discussion that we had um, regarding the tea masters in China. Uh, and then I was telling the story about uh, Fujioka that I'll continue when, um, when Jen comes back. And yes. uh, looks like we lost power here at the, the shop for um, the phone that, that lets you see me. But you can kind of see me from where you are, probably. <laughs> Should I just bring my phone there instead? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's cool. Um, but um, uh, so basically, the Bashan that we had last week is an example of a Phoenix Mountain Oolong that Jen's been talking mm -hmm. about throughout this entire discussion. So, yeah. So, yes. Um, Jen, are you back yet? Oh, okay. Oh, where did she go? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, she, while I was fixing the problem with the, the, the live stream, she was, she was. Oh, she good. went insane. Yeah. There's a. Um, but uh, do you remember the Yashi Shang, the the two different rose profiles? Oh there. yes. Um, sorry. I think there's like a bottle delivery happening right now. <laughs> there's oh, the really? wall there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, like a yeah. huge crate of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's. I told them that would probably happen while I'm on my live stream, but it's about to end shortly here. But I just wanted to tell a story of Fujioka once Jen comes back, and then we'll do... oh, 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 are you there? Okay, amazing, Jen. So, so Fujioka, um, he uh, he essentially he didn't have an um, email, so we actually had to communicate with him by fax in the beginning. Oh uh, no way! And then over the years, we've built up this relationship. Like he was the person who actually introduced us to single cultivar selections. Um, we actually asked him, why does he like the Yabukita uh, or the Okamidori? Why is the Okamidori more expensive than the Yabukita? I mean, on a cupping table, it tastes like it has more umami. It's going to just be a higher price because of its, the quality that it delivers. But he just kind of stared a little bit blankly. He's like, it's because I get less of it. I charge more. I charge the same based off of how much I harvest versus how much I get. I get 18 kilograms for 100 kilograms out of the... Okumidori, and I get 20 kilograms out of the um, out of the uh, out of the the yabukita, so it's cheaper because I get more. Isn't, uh. isn't that interesting? But he prefers the yabukita. He says it's the cultivar that's traditionally used for gyokuro production. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, seventh generation farmer and more, um, amazing, amazing fellow. Um, and uh, he's the local soil uh, uh, seller in his in his micro region in Wazaka as well. So he has a r really good connections with the local farmers. Um, he's also a rice farmer, um, really down to earth guy. And we're his only wholesale customer. You can't even get his stuff in Japan other than through him and Jaga Silk, which is kind of cool. That's wonderful. There's something so important about that connection with the farmers. Yeah, I really, I really Absolutely. think so. And I, I've been really enjoying. Like we're going to be working with a fellow named Mr. Yamaguchi pretty soon. And uh, he only produces 50 kilograms a year. And, and Takaki produces 60 kilograms of the Yabukita uh, specifically for us. And it, it's really nice when, you know, I don't necessarily, I love to be transparent, but one of the ways that we can interact with this idea of like, you know, I don't want to necessarily give away the baby with the bathwater, but at the same time, I really want to be open. So it's, it's, it's been interesting. And one of the ways is to just work with smaller and smaller farms and say, yeah. hey, you know, like we mm -hmm. love the quality you're producing. We'll just grab everything you got if you don't mind selling it to us. And then uh, when they're only producing 60 kilograms instead of thousands and thousands of tons, that makes that conversation a little bit easier, right? <laughs> well, wow. nice that Japan uh, allows those smaller farmers to export yeah. Yeah. to you because it was, it was one of the greatest problems we had. And, and luckily, I met this woman who actually lives in Toronto now, but her father is from Yunnan and she was born in Yunnan. And they um, were some of the first, one of the first families to sort of stretch into the farther regions right. of the area and put in roads and build a factory, a poor factory. And she was really amazing because she appreciated artisan tea. And I was saying to her, they had a shipping license 
And I said, listen, you know, if I can get this wild old growth tea puer from you, right. can I allow my other farmers, these other farmers that I'm working with in the smaller areas that can't have export licenses, yeah. you know, can they ship the tea to you and can you just put it in with yours and ship it to England? Yeah. And she was like, sure, no problem, Jen. I really want to support other small scale farmers. That's really cool. And it was, I just was like, thank you so much, because it was a real, I think within tea and the community of tea, that there's a real repro like reciprocity and like a, a of, uh, community. And I if I meet someone and they love tea, and, and I'm like, oh, I love tea too. And then we have this sort of instant um, of joy that we can share mm -hmm. and, and and it's very universal there's been times where i've been sitting when you when you go to these different regions one of my favorite stories was in fujian when i went to go and find some traditional taiwan yin mm -hmm. and uh went up into a, 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 a authentic village up on Xi mountain and the farmer was so poor and they were speaking the fujian dialect mm. oh cool okay they, which is actually Taiwanese. Like, oh, interesting. That, that's where um, the first sort of wave of okay. Chinese people that went to Taiwan were from Fujian. And they also brought a lot of the, of the Taiwan yin. And that's why Taiwan has such beautiful oolongs because a lot of the, the seeds that's and interesting. the were brought over from Fujian. We have a farmer uh, who reverse imports from Taiwan to Fujian, even though Fujian is like the birthplace of oolongs. You know, and then it's it's just ha it's done so well in Taiwan in terms of the level of attention to detail, etc. Um, okay. That that's been able to come out of the country. But then he's brought that like the Ching Shin cultivar, brought it back to Fujian and planted uh -huh. it in Fujian, and then he's producing. It's interesting this kind of this back and forth and and the trading and the the beautiful. I think um, some farmers are very competitive with each other, but it's really nice to see when people are a little bit more um, collaborative in their approach. I think it's more in the spirit of tea. Yeah. Yeah. That people that because there's always enough. It's like that saying, not for all the tea in China, because you go there and it's amazing. Like there's so much tea. And same within Taiwan, there's just, and, it, and, it, and I really feel grateful for those farmers, like your, your Yabagita, did I say that right? That's the cultivar. The farmer's name yeah. would be Fujioka. Fujioka. Thanks. I'm still yeah. learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's all good. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciated that, you know, once you went there and you met him and you, you made the effort and he, and you showed him that you, you have a, a tea heart. Yes. I think that that connection, when you can see people like look them in the eyes and you can, you can ascertain that level of sincerity and honesty and, and desire to just do something very, um, grassroots, but really meaningful. And then people connect with that. Those are, those are the right people. Um, one of my good friends, uh, again, Pedro, said that he only works with farmers that have dirt in their fingernails. And mm -hmm. I, I love that concept, right? If they're people that actually work the earth and they're not the suit and tie farmers, um, it, okay. it makes uh, it makes it uh, more meaningful, I think, on a, on a, on a really real level. He sources exquisite teas. Yeah. He's, he's like, it's a, it's a no fail there when you get any of his pruers that they're yeah. going to be amazing. They're going to be amazing. And Daniel yeah. over at, uh, or David, um, with uh, with the Chinese tea shop. He has an amazing selection as well. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, we're actually uh, reaching the end of our show here, oh. but I, um, we haven't, uh, it's been you and me talking most of the time and we sort of, Sister Speak has been an observer today, but she looks like she's enjoying herself. <laughs> I hope we have I, I, I'm really enjoying it. I actually muted my mic for a little bit because there was the big delivery happening and it was <laughs> quite the extraordinary. <laughs> the palette, the palette of 54 bottles or 54 cases of 24 bottles that arrived while we're doing the live stream. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. Um, so, um, but I've really enjoyed your conversation today, both of you. So thank you. And the tea was absolutely phenomenal. The awesome. matcha. You enjoyed the Yabukita by Fujioka? And it's such a great relationship. I, I, we had the Okamidori by Fujioka with Jim Finlayson in an earlier episode of Jagavision. 
and uh, yes. I really encourage everybody to, to, to check out the Abukita. Um, also, uh, we'll be doing a public Zoom cupping. So anybody that purchases a Yabukita um, by Fujioka will be sent a, a Zoom code. And um, if, you, if you can install Zoom, then we'll be doing that on July 20th at uh, 1 p.m. on the Monday there. Um, we'll be encouraging the general public to join in on a cupping. It won't be broadcasted live, so no worries there. But uh, anybody that wants to participate, that'd be awesome. But anyway, yeah, thank you, right. um, Sister Speak. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about what you do. Um, we did uh, talk a lot about what uh, Team Mistress is up to, um, but we didn't say what she's going to be doing next. So why don't we end with just a, if you can tell our viewers what's next for you um, as we're sort of, you know, we're not really through the pandemic, but let's say like during the pandemic, what, what, what are your plans? Um, and then uh, maybe a final, final words for our viewers. We'll start with Sister Speak. Oh, sure. Um, so I'm really focusing, I actually just work, was working on a grant two days ago and I had to answer that exact question. <laughs> okay. So I'm uh, focusing on live streams and composition. <laughs> live streams and composition. Okay. So writing as songs. Opposed to, as opposed to touring. Cause I had five, I just realized I had five tours that I canceled. Oh my. So. Wow. Yeah. And that's, you were, you were doing upwards of 200 shows a year at one point, right? Oh, wow. Sometimes, yes. Uh, usually around 150, maybe. Yeah. So basically every second day, if you do the math, you were doing a show. Um, yeah. Uh, so pretty active uh, touring schedule. And so to go to not touring now. Um, but I, I hope that this finds, uh, I know that for many musicians, it's really hard to create that space to really develop and hone new material. So I, I do hope that this, uh, this uh, allows for some really solid introspection and some really powerful songs to develop mm -hmm. yeah it's really been a special time overall I, I actually really appreciate the time to just unlearn learn educate write, and there's just so much to, to work on right now in our society so it's it's and it's really nice to have tea while doing it <laughs> nice and for our viewers we've been sponsoring sister speaks tours with tea um for the last six or seven years here and uh, it's been really nice to go and see shows internationally sometimes and see our logo on the posters and stuff. It's, it's, it's lovely. <laughs> and uh, almost the uh, I I embarrassing level of uh, promotion she does for us, which is, which is very sweet. Um, <laughs> and uh, so everybody should go check out uh, uh, patreon.com slash sister speak or Facebook live or Instagram live when she does her shows every Thursday at noon. Um, highly recommend it. Jen, you should check out sister speak. Lovely, lovely, powerful lyrics. Um, incredible sound. Um, really excited about the new album, the live album that she has coming out. Her live performances are dynamite, and I think the vinyl is available oh. for purchase, etc. On SisterSpeakMusic.com, is that the website? Yes, that's where it's all at. Yep. Oh, awesome. Uh, Jen, you want to um, uh, put in your two cents and then let us know what you're doing right. um, with your project in Salt Spring and where things are headed, and some final words for our viewers. Sure. I, I Sister Speak. I think that's really great that you've got a patron page I, mm. I think that's really the way forward my husband's a composer and music director and right now he's working with an artist in the uk that's quite like a like a pop star and what i what i found interesting is what they're doing now is they're making these concerts and filming them and then the audience will pay to watch them yes and i know they're they're getting like renting out the royal albert hall or something and then doing these full-on stage shows videoing it and then people can pay. So I like that you've got the patron page and also mm -hmm. you're live streaming once a week. I'm totally going to check you out. Now, is it Thursdays? Thursdays yes, at Thursdays at noon. Right for this show. Well, okay, that's a good day for me. I'll check it out next Thursday for sure. Awesome. Oh, cool. Well, music is, art and music are intrinsic to our our, our social development and our, and our consciousness development. And, and what I really realized in the COVID is, it's really stripped down and stripped away a lot of, of what maybe I had deemed as important or what I thought I needed. And, it, and, and in that raw state, what I missed most was collective joy and collective celebration mm. and also the power of art to deliver message without it. And when I say that power to deliver message in in a way that the the audience or the participant then can perceive it for themselves and 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 make their own 
sort of choice or feeling out of that because it, it lives in that liminal art and music. It's, it's not defined. Mm. So through creating it, it allows people to be more responsive to it because we're so bombarded with media and fake news and all these avenues telling us what are facts and what is real. And then you have this art and music that ends so hard. And it sort of can filter through easier in a softer way and you can integrate it and, and have an inner debate or discourse to help move forward in these strange times. So thank you. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a really powerful <laughs> words for uh, the importance of music and what makes it so important and empowering. Totally. For sure. Um, this yeah. summer, what I'm doing at, on Salt Spring is I, I opened up the tea school last year when I decided that I... I wasn't going to sell tea anymore because I have a daughter who's four and I just really wanted to focus on my family and it was taking a lot of time, um, as you know, Jared, to organize the tea and taste the tea and buy the tea and the back and forth. It just takes a lot. So I we moved to Salt Spring from, from London um, three years ago and we, we bought a beautiful house and um, it joyfully has a Japanese tea house. So cool. Um, yeah, so cool. Okay. Killer view of the ocean there, uh, and uh, it's a four and a half to ten. It's not totally traditional, but it's um, it's got its its charm. And so what I'm doing is I'm teaching introductory tea classes, and uh, some of them can be uh, very basic gong fu to learn how to pour in a traditional way. But also if you're just new to tea and want to learn more about tea and the varieties and the terroir and how to brew and mythology and history and and uh, processing, and then we have classes for that as well. And then, Jared, I was going to ask you, how do you how do I properly pronounce um, forest bathing? Is it Shinruku? Uh, uh, Shinruku? Shininyoku? Yeah, can you say that again for me? I knew yeah. I was saying it wrong. Shininyoku, I think. Shininyoku. Um, so I, I thought it would be really nice because during this time of COVID, one thing I did every day was I would take my daughter and my husband because he's like a, he just would live in the studio if I didn't take him out for a walk. Mm -hmm. uh, we would walk down to the beach every day and have tea ceremony. And that was oh, our like, so awesome. it was our daily sort of retreat, meditation, ritual, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. and so one thing I thought I could do during COVID is take people on our tea walk and have tea ceremony on the beach. That is so cool. Do things yeah. outside. Yeah, we're thinking that too. Mm -hmm. Like just, we're, we're thinking of opening up on uh, on Fridays potentially uh, in okay. July at some point, just for takeout only. Nice. Um, but it's such a beautiful mm -hmm. courtyard if people are careful with sanitation and, and you know, not, uh, you know, I just I don't want to be a part of the the problem in terms of transmitting the virus to the elderly yeah, or right. really anybody it seems, and yeah, so yeah. it's it's important to just watch that. But at the same time, these human connections are so important. So it's important. yeah, it's 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 been interesting. I know we we have plans where Jaga Silk is going to come at some point to your school and do a, a talk on uh, oh, yeah. matcha in food service, right? And no, not in food service. That'd be great too. But I just would like. I, I find that your knowledge is exceptional in talking about the different varieties and kinds and regions and territories and yeah. just mm -hmm. am blown away at your your breadth of knowledge there. And I, every time I come yeah. and sit down, I'm just like, whoa, it's like, <laughs> no, that's awesome. I learned so much. Well, that's so, very sweet. I learn a lot also from talking to you. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, I, I always find that stuff just so fascinating. The whole, um, conversation around varieties even in wine um mm -hmm. in coffee in chocolate i just i love the cult of our conversation and i okay. think it's it's underexplored i think in apples we think we don't even think about it but uh, the difference between a granny smith and a gala apple are like night and day okay. and, and so cultivars play a huge role in uh the flavor even if you grow them in exactly the same ways um you're gonna have completely different flavors between a yabukita and an okumirori or a Ambari and a Bannock burn in India, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I think it's and the Longjing number forty three, like that's like yeah. an amazing cultivar that's that's been developed in China that's being used even for Yunwu um, teas. And uh, even though the name doesn't imply it, that it would be used in that way at all. And so, I, I love the conversation around cultivars. So, yeah. definitely, yeah, we'll definitely have to make that happen. So yeah, maybe once things settle down, let's 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 figure out something for. Uh, but I, I hope everybody who's watching can uh, go to teamistress.com 
check out what Jen's up to um, and when things mm -hmm. develop. I guess you'll keep updates going on when those. Uh, yeah, on my Facebook page is the most sort of up to date right now because I'm still the website. I'm shifting because it was it was the tea shop before in the UK. Right, right, right. Like, now and now it's moved. all over to this, but on okay. the Facebook page and the Instagram is great, and it's all just Tea Mistress. So. All Tea Mistress. So yeah, you yeah. can uh, follow her at, at Tea Mistress. I guess is the and the yeah. link should be also on the. Um, um, I'll, I'll add that to the the description after the show gets archived for uh, talking about where to find you. Um, cool. And can you put Sister Speak on there too, please, so I can watch it on there. Yeah, for sure. We totally we have it up. Uh, we have um, it up. If you watch the archive version of this show, you can totally check it out. The it's on the screen as well, but it's also in the description. You can just click in the description. Oh, Goes cool. to her, okay. It will take you to her Patreon. Um, you can find the live shows on Facebook Live and Instagram as well, but you get the best quality yes. on Patreon for sure. Great. Okay. Well, and if anyone's well, in Spring, drop me a line because I I love to have tea, and I'm going to be doing the classes out on the deck. I'm just going to move amazing. this beautiful. Tea the deck and we'll sit I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can make that happen sooner rather than later for sure yeah, I hope so too. It'd thanks. Just be wonderful to see you. thanks Jen thank you so much for coming on the show Jennifer uh, Jen thank uh, you Jennifer um, Sherry Ann as usual huge appreciation to, to you as well um, you guys are uh, it was an amazing show today very laid back uh, but I think uh, really uh, I had a lot of fun talking to you both. Um, I'm sorry to Sherry Ann, I didn't. You didn't have a lot of speaking time today, but uh... it's okay. <laughs> no, it, it was like a comedy scene out here today. Okay. okay awesome. <laughs> well, looking forward to next week. And for our viewers who don't know this, happy birthday, Sherry Ann. Yeah, it's your oh. birthday. Today, so. <laughs> so it was uh, mentioned in the chat by by CA Woman One. Um, but uh, and oh, birthday. Cheryl from San Diego. Cool. Right. Awesome. Cool. So a uh, huge uh, appreciation for you coming on. Happy birthday. And uh, <laughs> keep the music strong. Keep the tea strong. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you, tea mistress. Thank you, Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, guys. Take care. So uh, yeah, thank you. That was a little bit of a, a longer show today, but I uh, had a lot of fun. Um, I lose track of time so quickly. We're looking at 2.40 now. Um, but uh, I hope you do, do go check out uh, Sister Speak, check out uh, Tea Mistress. Um, Jaga Silk is also doing our, um, our best to bring you some, some uh, education uh, through these new public Zoom cuppings that we'll be doing. So from your home, if you want to buy uh, Yabukita by Fujioka, go onto our webpage, look in the matcha shop. Uh, we do do free shipping across Canada. Um, we are um, starting that session at 1 p.m. Every Thursday, you see the Jagavision episodes coming out. Next week, um, it's going to be really exciting. We're going to have Malcolm from the Light Cellar in, in Calgary. He'll be joining us. And uh, we'll be drinking a, uh, um, a Kanaya Midori by uh, Takaki, um, one of uh, a selection that we bring in from time to time from the Takaki farm in, in Hoshinomura, uh, Japan. A after that session, we're actually going to have Takaki on the show. Um, so that show will be in Japanese. Um, there'll be a little bit of uh, kind of simul translation happening at the same time. So wish me luck with that. For those of you watching who can speak Japanese, I, I uh, apologize in advance for my, uh, my casual Japanese. I'm not much of a formal Japanese speaker, um, as I've learned most uh, of my Japanese from, from, from speaking more informally with people while I was in Japan. Um, but yeah, looking forward to both of those sessions. We'll be cupping samples of 2020 harvest with the farmer. So that's going to be exciting. So next week, Malcolm, if you want to look him up with the light seller. He is a magician when it comes to uh, viral therapy um, with uh, mushrooms. So like reishi mushrooms, chaga mushrooms, that kind of thing. Um, he's also just got an incredible elixir bar in Calgary. Um, and uh, you should go check them out. Um, and if you want to see updates on who's going to be on, what we're drinking, etc., go to jagasilk.com, look at the top page. You can also scroll down and you can join Jaga Spam and uh, you'll get newsletter updates, you'll get coupon codes, etc. if you're, you dig that kind of thing. We call it Jaga Spam, but uh, we try to make it as informative as possible and not just totally spam you. Um, and if you want to uh, join, um, or like subscribe for our YouTube channel and you're watching this right now, click subscribe and uh, might as well click for notifications too and then you'll get notified when our next show is going live. Watch for us tomorrow. Our plan is to also do a live uh, a flash cupping of uh, samples that we've, we have from various farmers um, that we've been getting in. We're gonna be focusing on parched greens tomorrow. So yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys watch then and I hope you take care. Thank you very much.
Have a wonderful day.